Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. According to the PISA education ranking, Korean pupils perform significantly better than most OECD students in all categories tested. Yet, this success comes at a steep price. The Korean school system is often described as nothing short of brutal. Its students are among the least happy and most stressed worldwide. At the core of the system is the Sunung examination, which determines university admissions. Because only a fraction of Sunung takers will ever be admitted to the best colleges, competition is fierce. Desperate to give their children an edge, parents invest in evening schools, private tutoring, and boot camps, fueling an entire industry now worth several billion dollars. For this episode, we had the pleasure of interviewing Stephen Dutt, who co-directed Reach for the Sky, a documentary that premiered at the 2015 Busan International Film Festival and was selected for the Doc Leipzig Festival in Germany. Reach for the Sky tells the story of several students, their families and teachers, as they prepare for the dreaded Sunung. Stephen Dutt is a Belgian filmmaker, producer and cinematographer. He studied film at the Royal Institute for Theatre, Cinema and Sound in Brussels and worked for several years in Hong Kong as a freelance producer and director. He founded Visual Antics in 2003, a Brussels-based independent production house. His films have screened in numerous festivals worldwide and have been broadcasted in over 30 countries. He is also the director of State of Play, a documentary that follows several South Korean professional video gamers. Stephen Dutt, welcome to Korea and the World. Thank you for having me here. What brought you to Korea and how did you start producing documentaries about the country? Um, I came to Korea in 2009. It wasn't really planned, but I was making a documentary about online virtual worlds. Well, Korea has always been quite uh, famous for the uh, gaming industry. And uh, at the time, there was a very famous game called Lineage, which was a really big success here. And I came to interview the designer of that game, J.K. Song. It was just going to be a very small segment about how Koreans deal with online communities. I was going to include something about SciWorld as well, which I believe now is dead. It doesn't exist anymore, but at the time it was still, like even before Facebook, it was really popular here. And that's how I ended up at the Yongsan I Park Mall uh, one day, where I saw these uh, professional gamers. And originally I was going to include that in the film as well, but I did. I, then I realized it had nothing to do with online communities. It was actually a sport, and that's how the idea started to make a, a movie about professional StarCraft players uh, here in Seoul. So that was the first film I did. And now five years later, I've made Reach for the Sky, which is about the Sunung exam and more or less about the Korean education system. And that film actually grew organically from State of Play, the, the film about the gamers, because what I noticed is when I interviewed these young kids, these gamers, I, I asked them, so why did you want to become a gamer? And all of them told me that they wanted to escape school, which was, I, f I found that quite fascinating because they had a pretty tough life. Like they, they would be in a team house and train for 12 hours sitting in front of a screen, live all together in a house and I was wondering, like, what is the school system like then if, you, if you're willing to give that up to become a professional uh, video gamer? You know, one thing always leads to the other, and uh, it's, it's quite nice to go from project to project if there's a bit of... Um, if the themes connect with each other. State of Play is about competitive sports, and Reach for the Sky is basically about competitive education. The themes, the core themes of the films are very similar in a way. You, that's also why I made them back to back. Before going any further, let's try to maybe define a few terms. What is the Sunung? Okay, so the Sunung exam is basically the final exam that every high school senior in Korea has to take 
in order to apply for universities. So I think all over the world there's there's different systems like that, but it's a uh, kind of like the the baccalauréat in uh, in France. I think uh, in the UK it has it has a different name, but and so it's similar to that. Every Korean student has to take it if they want to have a good chance to go to uh, to a good university, and it's happens once a year, usually on the second Thursday of November. So would you say that it is a state-sponsored SAT for American audience? Uh, yes, exactly. That's, that's what it is. Yeah, SATs, yeah. The title of your documentaries, Reach for the Sky, but Sky is all in capital letters. Why is that? Sky is um, a very common place abbreviation for the top three uh, universities Um, here in Seoul. It's the Seoul National University, University of Korea and Yonsei University. So you put those letters back to back, they spell out sky. They're considered to be the place to go if you want to move up in society in Korea. But as a title, I thought, you know, it would make perfect sense to to name it Reach for the Sky because it has that dual layer where Reach for the Skies, you know, very often people will understand that as you know, following your dreams and looking for what you really want to do. But unfortunately, over here, it means something completely different. And while well, sky is considered to be the root of all evil for a lot of uh, uh, young Korean students, because it, it involves so much pressure and it involves so much competition. In your documentary, you follow the lives of children in their late teens. Why did you select them? What is so special about those specific kids? When we started the film, we wanted to cover two different things. You have a high school senior, usually they go to a public school in Seoul or outside of Seoul, and they are called Gosam, so they, that's the, the high school seniors. It's the first time that they take the exam, because what we discovered is that if you don't have good grades, you can actually decide to retake the exam the next year. At that time, you've have, they have already graduated from high school, but all over the country there's private institutions where uh, students are trained to improve their scores. So we really wanted to show how the lives of these students are quite different. Like the, the life of a repeater, someone who retakes the exam, can be very Spartan in a way. You know, in, in the public schools, the, you still have the, the regular school life that everybody knows. You've got the playgrounds, you got the, the, the cafeterias where the kids have lunch. There's, it's a lot more lively. And in the private institutions, the only focus there is to increase the possible score that you will get on the exam. So the, there's different types of private institutions. There are day schools where you just you enroll, you go there, and it's like a regular school in a way. You you start at seven o'clock, you have your classes during the day. But what's different is that you keep studying until ten or eleven at night, and then you go home. Some high school students do that as well. So when they finish school around four o'clock, they will go to a private institution uh, where they get extra tuition also to help them improve the score. And then what is quite unique in the film is that we also managed to get inside a boarding school where students basically stay for nine months. They have to hand in their phones. They are completely disconnected from the outside world. And there they kind of live in a kind of army style uh, routine where they study from morning till night. And the ultimate focus there is to get the best score on the exam. Parents pay a lot of money for this. It's uh, really expensive. And it doesn't often always um, give the results that people expect. But why so many private institutions? Isn't the school actually supposed to prepare the students to take the sunung? The issue there is that a lot of parents consider public schools to be inadequate to prepare their children to have good grades. It's not that the teachers are not good, but the system of applying for a university is very, very complicated. Every university has different ways to apply. There are different application methods. They, they, they change on a yearly basis. Uh, the guidelines are always on the websites, but it's sometimes it's almost like a, a 10-page manual on how to do things. And a lot of the teachers in public schools, they just they don't have the time to keep track of all this. So they, they don't have the ability to give good advice to the students, to consult the parents, explain to them what they have to do in order to get to a certain school. And that's where these private academies come in, because these guys get paid to do exactly that, 
to find out how a certain student, what his or her chances are to get into that specific university where they want to go, um, how they should do that, uh, what they should focus on, what kind of grades they should get for certain subjects. And if you listen to some of these consultations that, for instance, is also in the film, it's what you see, it's, it's almost like a military strategy in order to get into a university. They take the, the, the whole context of, the, of one specific student, they use that, they look at the grades that they had in the previous years, and they m kind of make a custom-made strategy for that person. And of course, in return, they charge a lot of money for that. And because parents find it so important where their children go to university, there's a huge demand for this. So that's, that's why they're willing to pay so much money to get their children into one of these private institutions, because they feel that if they don't do that, they don't have the same chances as the other students. So it's almost, uh, parents also almost consider it a duty to give their children these kind of possibilities. Is the exam competitive in nature or is it based on absolute grading? It's competitive in nature because the higher your score, the better the chance to get into a top university. For instance, one of the students in the film, he's, um, there's one scene where he, he's lying on his bed at night and his dorm room buddies are asking him like, so you're going to go to Korean University, what kind of grades do you need for that? And basically he's done the calculations and he has realized that to get in there he has to be in the top uh, 0.1% of all the students taking that exam that year in order to get uh, where he wants to go. So maybe he's not comparing himself to the other students in his class but he's constantly evaluating the progress that he makes. They have three mock exams throughout the year, which is kind of like a, a test run for how you might perform on the actual exam itself. You know, they use that as a benchmark to see where they're going to go. So there's this constant stress if you don't do well that you might actually fail on the exam as well. And failing, of course, is it's a very relative concept because these guys have like 96, 97% out of 100 if you would have that in, in Belgium, where I'm from, you're the best student of the school. But over here, that doesn't have to be true at all. One of the person you follow is a rock star type of uh, instructor, of tutor, who is working in one of the biggest academies in Korea. Why is that even possible? How can a teacher be so rich and famous? He's a very colorful character. He's been a teacher for... 20 years now, I think. He's an English teacher. Um, he works for one of the biggest private uh, institutions in Seoul, Mega Study. Mega Study doesn't only provide English classes, they also have like online lectures, which which made them very popular from the late 90s when, you know, with the internet boom and it just became a very lucrative business to record classes and sell them online for a few dollars. You know, not, not every family was able to pay the tuition fees to have their children go to these private classes. So in order to reach that segment of the market that only had tight budget to spare on this, uh, they, they released the uh, online lecture. So that's one of his fortes. He's really... Uh, he's really good at that. He's very popular. And he basically takes a percentage of those sales. Now, next to that, so he's a teacher. He teaches English. Uh, he does the online classes, which he records on, um, on a monthly basis. And every year, they also have to re-record different lectures. So it's not like you record one lecture and you can use it for the next five years because the classes have to be revised on a yearly basis, just as well as the textbooks, which the students use. Clever guy as he is, he has also started his own publishing company, writing textbooks for the for the students. So all all this together has made him a very wealthy man. And the the reason why that is even possible is what we touched upon before. There is this huge demand for private tuition, and basically what this teacher is doing is providing that for the for the parents. He makes altogether four million US dollars a year which is, um, I'm pretty sure for a lot of teachers around the world, an absurd figure. But because of this academic frenzy in South Korea, that's just simply how it is. That's the way, that's the way that this, this business has been booming here. A question that comes to mind when watching the documentary is, 
how did you get access, I mean, to that rock star teacher, to the private boarding school? Yes, they're very, they're very close circles and, and the access was actually the thing that was the most difficult in this film. For the private institutions, well, maybe first I should explain how we went along casting these students. The first step would be to find a school that would allow us to film there. With the public school, that took quite a long time because students who prepare for the exam, they don't necessarily want to get distracted by a camera crew that would be there very often. You know, we, we would just hang out in the school and we would look around and we would try to stay as low profile as possible, but still we would be there. Uh, a lot of the schools were worried that it would interfere with the results that the students would finally get. That would mean that they would be afraid that the parents would complain. They would probably be afraid of possible lawsuits afterwards. So, But finally we got lucky, we found the school. Same thing would be for the private institutions, same approach. And then when we finally got permission to shoot in the school, we would put up a notice saying that we would film there, we would briefly explain what the film was going to be about, and we asked for volunteers, students who would sign up for a casting interview, which was quite successful. We would normally have about 20, 30 kids per school that would show up. Um, we would ask them a few brief questions. We would film it, 10 minute interview, kind of making a profile of what the person uh, in front of us was like. Uh, what, what did they want to do? Where, which school did they want to go to? What was the religion of their parents? You know, small, small things just to get to know the people. And then when we finally found the students, of course we had to talk to the parents and that was the final step. Uh, so if all those three gates were cleared, we could continue and that's how we found our characters. So at the end we ended up following about six people of which three students actually made it to the final film. Now for the, the, the rock star teacher, that was actually very straightforward. We had a meeting with him, we explained the kind of film that we wanted to make, we also explained that it was not our intention to judge or to criticize. We just wanted to show how the industry works. And he was very open for that. He didn't have any intention of hiding anything. He also, he also doesn't believe that he's doing something wrong. I also don't think he's, he's doing uh, the wrong thing. He's, he has seen an opportunity he has, um, and he has used that. And he actually generally cares about a lot of his students. So that's kind of the dual thing about it. When, when people look at it, they consider him to be a profiteer, making money on the back of the students. But, you know, if there wasn't such a demand, he would probably go and do something else. You know, I think he wanted to be a filmmaker or something like that. But he ended up being a teacher. So with him, it was quite straightforward. And then we had to convince Mega Study to film there, which is a, a really big company it's it's listed on the stock market so they were a bit hesitant but at the end because the the teacher wanted to go along with it they said okay go ahead and we got full access to all the behind the scene meetings uh, we could go to the big venues for instance the big gathering which is also featured in the film in, in the olympic stadium we were always there and yeah we we were free to go wherever we wanted You mentioned earlier that the private boarding school were quite spartan and looking at the documentary, they actually look a lot more like a prison than any type of teaching institution. It must be a very difficult experience for the students. Well, actually, these schools are referred to as uh, Sparta schools. We didn't use that name because I think it's a little bit judgmental, but a lot of the teachers and a lot of the students, if you say Sparta school, that they know exactly what you mean. And... These, these schools are, are set up with the sole reason to um, maximize the, the possibility of, to have a good score. They're constructed in such a way that boys and girls live in completely separate areas of the school. They have their own dorm rooms. They're not allowed to speak to each other. The cafeteria is also completely separated. So even if the, the classes are mixed, boys shouldn't be seen talking to girls and the other way around. The way of teaching is very different from what I was used to. Teachers really make it clear that everybody who comes in there, if they don't study hard, they're going to be complete failures. So, so from the very beginning, that kind of attitude is taken in the class. Instead of encouraging your students or working in a positive way with them, they're kind of belittled and say, look guys, you know, if you just sleep for five minutes uh, in class, you're going to fail. 
If you talk to a girl, you're gonna fail. If you chat with your friends during lunch, you're gonna fail. So almost from morning till evening, students get the idea that they just have to grind and grind and grind and sit in front of their desk for 16 hours, 17 hours and study. But to do that for nine months is completely not efficient. But yet they feel forced to do it because if they don't, then they don't study as hard as their classmates, which means that they're not engaged enough in their studies, which means they might disappoint their parents and so on and so on. So there is not so much any physical harm in going to a school like this, but mentally it's extremely exhausting. And that's why you see a lot of these students, some of them give up, they just can't handle it anymore. And after four months, they just go, okay, I want to go back home, which they can. I mean, they're free to go. They're free to give up, but a lot of students don't want to disappoint their parents. A lot of students don't want to disappoint themselves. So they feel that as a 19 year old, they have to endure. And this is what it takes to become a, a successful person in South Korea. That's what, they, that's what they often believe. Beyond the expectations of the parents, does society put pressure on the students? Obviously, because as I said before, the issue at hand usually lies with the parents. There's this hierarchy in, in universities. There's a hierarchy in Korean society as well. As one of the boys in the, in the movie says, we asked him, why do you want to go to Korea University? He didn't say that he wanted to become uh, an engineer or he wanted to uh, become a scientist. Or he, It was not about what he wanted to do later in life. It was about, you know, he said, if I go to Korea University, I'm going to climb up the ladder. I'm going to become a more important person. People are going to look at me and say, oh, you've been to Korea University. He thought that was so important because, uh, as he says it as well, he he couldn't stand the fact that people around him would get hurt and he wouldn't be able to help them. And for him, going to Korea University was a way to become more powerful, more important, to be seen as a more person that had to be respected because of the name value of the school. That's a pretty old concept, and of course that is changing, but still in a lot of people's minds it's still there. And that's why they, they push their kids to go to a really good university. It's also in a, in a way kind of selfish, because a lot of the, I think a lot of the parents uh, look at their children as an investment. Sending your kid to a, a good university also means that they're going to do well in life and they're also going to be able to take care of the parents later on. You know, I don't think the, the social security or the pension system is extremely well developed here. So there's always that setback that, you know, when you're old, someone has to take care of you. So children are often seen as um, a, a way to achieve that. Of course, all this results in a lot of pressure on the on the students. I'm not very good with statistics, but I remember reading that South Korea in all of the OECD countries has the highest suicide rate between 15 and 25. If you ask yourself, why is that? That's quite obvious. It's, it's the pressure that is being put on these students from a very young age. You know, when between 15 and 25, unless you grow up in a dysfunctional family, there shouldn't be all that much stress. It's a time where you're supposed to be free, a time where you're supposed to be enjoying time with your friends, but these figures clearly show something else. So that's, that's probably the most extreme example of the, the consequences of this uh, amount of pressure, but it, it, it goes in many different ways. I mean, students have sleeping problems, students have back aches from sitting in front of the desk for so long, have indigestion problems. Um, all, all this is very clearly stated in, in, in the beginning of the film, which is quite uh, amazing how we found this, this footage from 1971, where the Minister of Education basically spells out all the problems that these kids are having. And he says, you know, in a message to society, to the public, he says, you know, we have to focus less on the exam system and help our kids to become better human beings. And this is, you know, this we're talking 40 years ago, and they already knew this, but yeah, it's still going on. Something quite shocking when watching the movie is that as the students learn English, you never actually see them writing in English or speaking in English. Is the Sunung just some kind of very sophisticated exercise for seventh monkeys 
who just repeat tricks but never actually learn to use that knowledge in practice. It's um, it's a rather harsh way of putting it, but um, I uh, I understand where where you're heading with this. Um, I think it's that that's one of the key issues with methods of teaching in South Korea, and I think a lot of the foreign teachers will have probably have experienced that. There's a very one-directional way of teaching a class over here. For instance, for this movie, I, I went to several English classes by different teachers uh, in the public school, uh, in the private school, also in the the rock star teacher, um, his Saturday classes, which would be from six o'clock in the evening until 10. And what you see there is that the teacher basically stands in front of the class and gives a monologue for four hours, you know, the in, in case of this, this Saturday afternoon, uh, Saturday evening uh, English class. And that's usually the way that students learn English. So what you know, what, what you will notice is when I was speaking to the students, their knowledge of English is actually quite good. Uh, I would talk to the students and they would almost understand everything I was saying. The only problem is they couldn't talk back because they've just never had to do that. They start learning English for years and years, but they never have to interact. There's no focus on conversational English. And what I've heard from a lot of um, foreign teachers, English teachers, is that even if they want to try and change that approach, very often they are held back by the institution itself, by the school itself, because that is there to learn a language, but it's not there to maximize your score on the exam. If you focus on what the school is actually for, you will realize that it's really about maximizing the score on this exam. And for that, you don't have to be able to speak the language very well because it's not part of the exam. There is no conversational aspect in the exam. There's the listening test, there's the writing test. So if you just apply it to that, it all makes sense. It's it's just there to to get a high score. And to be able to speak English well is just not relevant if that's what you want to achieve. Right, this is a generalization, but after the exam, there's obviously more tests. There's um, there's entrance exams for the universities. But even after universities, if you want to go to um, work for a good company like Samsung, for instance, you will also have to take a test. And those English tests are exactly the same. There's never any reason to be able to speak English well. For instance, if you look at the rock star teacher, I mean, this is a guy who makes four million US dollars a year, and he admits that his English is not that good. He speaks it well, he has a, a good range of vocab, but for instance in our conversations you could tell that he was not as confident as someone who claims to be the best English teacher of South Korea. He wasn't as confident as all, at all. I mean, he would also not reply my emails in English because it would take too much time. You could tell that he was not, he was not comfortable with it because he just didn't master the language all that well. In addition to the classes themselves, are there other infrastructures provided for the students? Maybe study technique classes or mental preparation classes? In the movie, there is one particular scene which um, we all thought we had to include, and this is in the, we'll call it the Sparta school, where there's a, a mental class, they called it. And there you have a kind of special teacher, more like a, a guru, and he stands in front of the class and he, he gives kind of a, a hypnosis class. He turns off the lights, students close their eyes, and for about 20 minutes, he just repeats the same mantra that they have to clear their minds, they have to picture themselves on the actual Sunung day where they will wake up and they will have all the energy to um, take the exam when they study, they will absorb everything. Their brain will become more powerful, will become bigger. But apart from the, the classes, there's, there's definitely this kind of religious-like aspect to it where everything is focused, everything they do is, is focused on that actual day. What happens after that, you know, the exam applications, that's not really the focus of the schools. That's a, another type of consultant who will be um, uh, responsible for that. That was one of the revelations there, I think. I mean, it's great visual material because I think a lot of um, a non-Korean audience, or even for a Korean audience, it's, it's, it's really, it's a bizarre thing to see. It's a preacher-like, church-like uh, atmosphere. Moving on to the day of Sunung itself, what is it like? 
it's an amazing thing to see how a whole city can come to a standstill on that particular day. I think that was also one of the main selling points when we talked about, you know, we're going to make a, a movie about the South Korean education system. And people would ask me, well, what's what's special about that? And what really speaks to, you, to the imagination is when you, you tell people like, you know, on that day, the, the, the stock market opens an hour later during the listening tests planes are not allowed to take off because they would create too much noise and it would distract the students. Trains have to slow down, buses cannot honk, cars are asked not to drive close to the schools to avoid traffic jams. If you're late for the exam or you think you'll be late, you can call an emergency number, a police car or a police motor will come and escort you and bring you to the exam center. That is an amazing feature for a country. I don't think there's any other country in the world where an exam day really brings a city or a country to a halt. What I also found really amazing is that the news reports on this almost on an hourly basis. It's like following a, a sports event. At five o'clock, they come out with the weather report and they say, you know, today is the Sunung day. You hear news reporters saying they've now taken the English test, they've now taken the Korean test, and, and all this just continues until the evening where on national TV at eight o'clock, the exam questions are being discussed in a TV program. You know, students can check how they did through a TV program. I mean, that's unheard of. That's uh, at least in, 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 in Belgium that nobody would even care. Nobody would even want to see that on primetime uh, TV. But over here, that's, uh, that's a reality. What is the exam like for the students? There's, there's five different segments. It's basically multiple choice. You have a certain amount of time to complete the exam. Uh, you take a break, then you move on. There is Korean, there is English, there is mathematics. And then there's also the option to have a uh, foreign language. But not everybody is uh, required to take those, it's, it's optional. So you basically sit through those different segments of the day. You try to complete everything to the best of your knowledge. Some of the questions you don't know, you try to guess them. Students have always also been prepared for that. There are certain techniques to uh, make sure that you guess correctly or you increase your um, chances to um, answer it right. Like a regular school day around five o'clock, uh, the bell rings and uh, it's over, you know. It's a day they've lived to for um, probably their entire high school uh, career. That day is obviously very stressful for the students, but the parents have prepared for it as well in many ways. How do they live through that day? If you take the um, film as a starting point, we built the whole film we built towards a, a certain climax of the exam day. But quickly we realized that showing the exam itself, uh, first of all, it wouldn't even be possible to get into the classrooms, but it's also extremely boring. Nothing is happening. It's just students in a classroom at a desk filling in multiple choice questions. What is really exciting is what happens all around that. And what we really wanted to show is how this exam really brings the whole country together with churches and temples and, and, and what so forth, how the whole nation is almost supporting these students the entire day. And I thought that was, uh, you know, there's lots of negative aspects about the system, but I actually thought that was a very beautiful thing. One of our students, his mother was uh, very religious. She would go to church on a weekly basis, twice, twice a week. And on the exam day, she went to church with all the other mothers. And the church follows the exact same time schedule of the exam. So when the students would be taking English, there would be a, a reverend giving a, a sermon about the English language. They would pray, they would sing, they would cry. Then they would take a 10 minute break and it would be time for mathematics. And then the reverend uh, responsible for the mathematics uh, exam would come in. And that would continue exactly uh, until five o'clock when the students would come out of school. And that's when they would also stop praying. The same thing happened for um, the Buddhist temples. Um, we had one student whose mother was a, a Buddhist. There's a very famous temple called Kapawi uh, in Daegu, where a lot of parents actually make the trip from Seoul 
they go there at night, they climb the mountain, and they pray all night and all day until, again, 5 p.m., uh, when the exam is finished. So that's um, the mental support that these people show for their children is, uh, is absolutely overwhelming. When the students are done taking the sunung, however, they are not yet into university. They need to get the results and actually apply. When do they know about those results? And really, what is the process of application per se? Trying to find a structure in making this film, we encountered a pretty specific problem, is that if you would take a fiction film, you would work towards the day of the exam, and then students would basically know their results. That would be the climax and the release, the aftermath. But what we came to realize is that that's actually not the case. You know, so we, we build up towards the exam day. Students unofficially know their exam results on the same night because they get to keep the question sheet from the exam and they can follow the TV broadcast or they know that, for instance, their private institution will, they will release the questions and the answers on the website so they can actually double check and see how they did. So by, even if the official uh, score is only released uh, a few weeks later, uh, at least they have a good idea whether they got questions wrong, what they will do for a certain subject, so they can kind of predict what the next steps are going to be. The problem is that after Sunu, this whole maze or this whole labyrinth of applying for university starts. So it's not the end at all. There's actually another three to four months of applying, of looking for ways to get into a university. There's various private consultants who you also have to pay. Uh, they will help you build a strategy to apply for a university. Some will charge money to write a cover letter. You have to get letters of recommendation. You have to... Basically, everything you've done in the last six years is being considered as part of your application. So that's also extremely boring. And it's also a very tedious task to take care of. So we tried to find uh, an exciting way to portray that in the film uh, without boring the audience or confusing the audience because, of course, everybody, especially a, a European or a foreign audience, they would be convinced that at the end of the exam, you know, that's the end of the film. But it definitely isn't. Going back to the title of your movie, did any of those three students you followed actually reach the sky? No, they didn't. When you know that only 0.1% of all the students taking the exam ends up in these universities, we always knew from the very beginning that it would be very unlikely that we would have a student in our film that would actually make it. But to be honest, it, to me it never mattered because the, what was most important is that we could follow the journey of these students and at the end what we wanted to show was what it feels like to be a student in South Korea and to have an audience identify with them and see what these kids would have to go through. That was the, the main target. What is clear is also that, without giving too many uh, spoilers, a lot of the students do manage to get into a university where they really want to go or what they're satisfied with or the parents are happy with. But then there's also one student who doesn't make it and who has convinced himself that he will repeat it again for a third time. And that happens to be the boy that wants to go to Korea University. He has given himself such a, a difficult task, but even after doing the exam two times, he's still convinced he can do it better, and he will dedicate another year to get in there. To make it clear that students who could not access Korea University, he could still go to a university Yes, exactly. Uh, and that is often the issue at hand. Uh, he had a really high score. He could get into a fair number of universities, but he refused because he really wants to go to Korea University. His parents have told him that the name of the university is not that important. They tried to convince him that he could have a successful career by going to, in his eyes, an inferior uh, university. But uh, that's something that he just doesn't want to hear. It's, uh, he has made it clear for himself that this is what he wants to do. 
And I think that's um, very often also the advice that a lot of teachers will give. Yeah? When students go to consultants about, you know, what, what university should I apply for? Very often they take the score of the Sunung and they look at the application requirements of the universities. And then you basically get a list of universities where you could apply to but they're all arranged on level of hierarchy so there's a list of uh, the ranking of a university the lower grade university you, you apply for the higher chance you have to get in so that's often the the wager that students and parents have to make like do i want to go there do i want to go to iwa university but i only have a 20 percent chance to get accepted or should I go to, you know, a lower grade university and have a 75% chance to get accepted? So that, that's kind of the dilemma that a lot of, a lot of students uh, have to deal with. So you cannot apply to more than one university? It's mutually exclusive? You can apply for, um, if I remember correctly, three universities. Correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm not 100% sure, but this is where it becomes quite technical. There's three different groups you can apply for as a ABC. And this is how teachers will then give you a strategy of your success rate of applications. So this is, again, uh, these are specialized classes that would go on for an entire week where um, people are just given all the necessary information to what universities they can apply uh, with the current score that they have. After watching your documentary, Reach for the Sky, one is left with the feeling that there is really no winner. I mean, even those who succeeded, even those who got into the university they wanted, sacrificed a huge amount of their youth. The family spent outrageous amount of money on their education. And yes, they're accepted, but that's not the end. Is that one of the general implications of your documentary? It's the conclusion that you could make. Of course, we set out this film to show and to explain. It was never our intention to... Um, to judge. I think the audience is, is clever enough to figure out what they think of this system. I don't think there's any education system that is perfect. It's not like you could take the Belgian education system and apply that to South Korea. It wouldn't work just the way that the South Korean system would never work uh, in Belgium either. I think at the end, what is maybe bittersweet is that the people that benefit the most of, of this whole system are, of course, the private companies, but also the churches, the temples. What is very clear is that everybody around the parents and the students want to have a piece of the cake. You know, they see what students have to go through, probably because they have children of their own, because they have grown up in Korea. Everybody knows how it works. Everybody can relate to it and they know how much emphasis is being put on this academic achievement. So at the end, it's the people who benefit from this financially are not the parents and the students, but everything that happens around them. Very often when we screen the film in the Q&A, people ask me, is that, what's the solution? And I tell them I have, you know, there is no short-term solution for this because the problem still lies within society itself. I mean, the government has tried many ways to improve this system, to look for different ways that people wouldn't rely so much on the type of university you go to or the type of company you work for. They've tried to uh, make private institutions illegal. That's something that will never work because if you do that, people with enough money will just find private teachers to come to their home and teach the kids that way. And that already creates a bigger imbalance than there is now already. So I think it's in, in, at the end, it's a generation thing. I do believe that young Koreans see that there's a problem. I do think that they want to change how things work. I do think that maybe they will not have their own kids go through this. Uh, but that's something, of course, that only uh, time can tell. If you see the, the, you know, one of the girls in, in, in the movie, uh, when you hear her talk, it gives hope because what she says as well, you know, she wants to be a teacher later in her life. That's what she's studying for. She goes to the Seoul National University of Education. And she says, you know, I want to help students find their dreams. I don't want to have them only focus on a high score. I want to, from an early part of their life, I want to help them look for what they really want to do later on in life. And I think that's one of the main things that lack 
these days is people just focus on getting that score and getting into university but once they get to the university they forgot why they're there in the first place i think if 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 we can put more emphasis on that there's definitely a, a bright future for south korean students maybe playing the devil's advocate it seems that the system as it is in place right now just repeats itself For example, the retaker who aims to go to Korea University will have to attend some kind of a hagwon again. He will have to buy all the books. And that's a lot of money. Does it mean that only the students who come from wealthy family, who probably have parents or aunts, who went to those universities as well, are actually really able to reach the sky? There's definitely some truth in that. The whole reason why the Sunu exam and the system around it was created was actually to offer the same chances to everybody you know but while the intentions were good to set it up in practice it obviously doesn't work like that i mean it's true people with more money to spend on private education will get better results the wealthy families often have uh, that kind of advantage but that's also of course because it has little to do with knowledge it has to do with how well you can prepare for the exam so that's already a way where this exam system has failed not why it was set up but actually how it is constructed but at the same time i do think that it's not going to repeat itself anymore i always compare it to the situation in europe uh, after the second world war And, you know south korea has developed really really fast and a lot of the grandparents and the parents they have experienced a time where things are really rough and usually when things settle down everybody wants to have a better future for the next generation and the resources in korea are quite limited so what you have is people education is really that's the crucial way to have a better life uh, for your kids for your grandkids I remember my parents telling me that, you know, my grandparents from after the Second World War, they wanted my father to go to a university, to to go to a college. They were working class and they didn't want their kids to have to work in a factory too. So that kind of reaction is completely logical. It's not just a South Korean thing. It's it's a human thing. But that kind of that kind of attitude has changed as well with the generations. You know, my my parents never made a problem of me going to film school. I will never put pressure on my children to go to a certain university for for all I care, to, you know, if they want to be carpenters, they should, you know. It's a, it's it's a great craft, it's a great profession. And I think that that will eventually happen here as well. It's just a, a matter of time. You have been working on this project for years now, uh, ever since 2011. How has your perception of the Korean education system changed since then? Well, I had I had been to secondary school in Hong Kong so not that those systems are the same but it didn't come as much as a as a shock to me to see how the schools function here and all that but what really changed my perception over the years is that when I started this project I was really somehow convinced that most of the students were actually victims of what the parents wanted you know I was I really thought that you know all these parents they put so much pressure on their kids but then when making this film and talking to these students what i realized is that a lot of the students are victims of their own ambitions you know they they very often they have some very understanding parents who not necessarily want their children to go through all this pressure but they bring the pressure upon themselves and that, that that for me is probably the biggest revelation i had uh, while making this it's uh, maybe my my understanding of the 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 whole system was a little bit black and white and at the end you know you definitely see all the gray zones uh in there well it's, i i i guess it's normal after four years being immersed in a system like this that you do get to discover the subtle differences and that's a, at the end why um why i make films is not to teach but to also understand something better in conclusion In preparation for this interview, the team of Korean the World watched the documentary and we all really loved it. But what about local audiences? In October you presented the movie at the Busan International Film Festival. How was it received? Well, for me that was um a really important moment, uh not because it meant the end of the production process and the first time that we showed it to uh, audience, but it was also the first time we showed it in Korea and for all the movies i make i set myself 
uh, one rule and that is it has to work in the country where we've been filming so for me showing it in Korea and having a Korean audience reacting to it and actually considering it to be a story that they can identify with is always really crucial showing it in Busan being selected for a festival like that obviously is a great start for the film's career but when I was sitting in the audience I was extremely nervous because I didn't know if people would react in the way that we wanted them to react if they laughed with the jokes that we thought was funny if they had the same emotional response and it was extremely wonderful and and it was a huge relief to uh, you know 45 minutes into the film people had laughed a lot Obviously, there is a lot of humor in the language that is kind of lost to a foreign audience that watches it through subtitles. But some of the scenes are actually really funny. And then 45 minutes into the film, you see a lot of handbags being opened and tissue appears. And, you know, people were crying. A lot of people really could relate to what they see because almost every family has been through it. And one of the best reactions that I heard is uh, my production manager, her mother, My production manager graduated from uh, Yonsei University and her mother had come to the screening as well. And at the end of the film, uh, she told her, my daughter, I'm really sorry because I never understood what you had to go through. You know, and that's, um, as a filmmaker, you can only be extremely happy when this is something you hear afterwards. That's the best best compliment uh, you could possibly get is that people identify with something uh, and relate to it. Stephen Dutt, thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.